joining us again. And um, <clears throat> there was an article in the Wall Street Journal um, about, I'm going to say, March of 2013 on the exact topic that Madeline Cohen and her group are going to present on called Flipping the Classroom. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Madeline Cohen, and her presentation is Flipping the Lehman College Classroom. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending this session. Um, my colleagues are Deborah Sanders, professor in the Business and Economics Department at Lehman College, and Jennifer Pajali, um, professor and instructional technologies librarian at the library. I am the head of reference at the Leonard Leaf Library at Lehman College. Um, we are going to um, tell you about a collaborative project between the library and the business and economics department to teach library business research uh, within this subject discipline. So um, to start the ball rolling, I'm going to turn over to Jennifer, who will um, go through the agenda and um, introduce the whole topic of flipped classroom. Thanks, Madeline. Uh, hi, again, my name is Jennifer Pajali. Um, I have been working with Madeline and with Deborah on a flipped classroom project this semester that Madeline has been heading up. Um, so we're going to talk today about what the flipped classroom is. Um, and then we're going to present you with our project, what we've been doing in the library. Uh, and we hope that this will be a model to you that will inform you of some of the ways to flip the classroom and some of the challenges and some of the discoveries we've made along the way. And we also hope that it will serve as something of an inspiration to you because it really is an achievable uh, model and it's something that we find a lot of value in. So um, we're going to tell you what the flipped classroom is, how it's done, what we've done, what we've learned, and then hopefully if we have time, we may have a chance for you guys to think a little bit about flipping the classroom at your institution. And then we will certainly have time for discussion and for questions. So what is the flipped classroom? I guess we should all get on the same page with this and have a um, common understanding of what that phrase means. So we're, I'm gonna show a short video, 60 second video, about the flipped classroom. Hopefully this will work for those. Hi, I'm Julie Schell, and I'm going to provide a 60-second definition of a flipped classroom aided by a terrific visual from the Center for Teaching and Learning at the University of Texas at Austin. All right, let's go. The easiest way to define a flipped classroom is to think about it in contrast to a traditional class. In a traditional class, students usually get first exposure to course content inside the classroom via direct instruction from their teachers. For example, the first time they hear about the Pythagorean theorem happens during class time. In a flipped class, that first exposure to content happens before the class meets. Students prepare for class time by doing some kind of coverage activity. For example, by watching a lecture video created by their teacher or created by someone else, or by completing a reading assignment. During class, Students work on applying the key concepts or ideas they covered in their out-of-class work. They interact with their peers and their instructors during class time. The cycle completes when, after class, students use that feedback gained during class time to further their learning by reviewing concepts they found difficult, confusing, or interesting. Streaming throughout the entire process are the learning goals, the big picture ideas regarding what students should know and be able to do with the particular content being studied. And that's the flipped classroom in 60 seconds. Hey, <laughs> it's like speed talking, right? Um, so, but the, the basic idea is there. Um, what this, the flipped classroom tries to do is to move us away from using in-class lectures as the primary mode of delivering course content and taking that lecture or that delivery of course content and doing it before the students come to class as a homework assignment or some other at-home work. Um, now, I think that that video actually leaves out two important aspects of the flipped classroom as we define it. And um, those aspects are 
the use of technology to deliver that homework assignment. Um, a lot of you are probably thinking, well, I did, I had course content delivered to me through readings when I was in school, and this is true. Um, so there's certain things about the flipped classroom that aren't necessarily revolutionary, but I think one thing that makes it different is that um, you are using technology to deliver that homework. And we're gonna talk a little bit more later on about what the benefits of that are. Um, and then the other thing that I think is very important about the flipped classroom is that it emphasizes active learning in class. And I've put a short definition of active learning up on this slide. It's a, a process whereby students engage in activities such as reading, writing, discussion, or problem solving that promote analysis, synthesis, and evaluation of class content. So we want that class time to be spent in really meaningful engagement with the course content, and we think that active learning can do that. And just a few examples, we're going to talk a little more about active learning as well, but a few examples of what it might mean is that you could be doing discussions in class, brainstorming or debates. You could have games, very hot right now doing games, um, projects and presentations, group presentations or individual presentations. So um, flipped is a very big topic right now. Um, it actually, the, the phrase started around 2007 with um, these two guys, um, John Bergman and Aaron Sams, and they're actually K through 12 teachers. I think they're middle school or high school teachers, I'm not sure. Um, and they wrote a book about flipping the classroom and they've really used it a lot in their K through 12 teaching. But it started to move up into higher ed and if you go to the Chronicle of Higher Education and search for the flipped classroom, you will get a plethora of articles that you can read more about what other people are doing out there in the higher ed world with the flipped classroom. So with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Deborah, who's gonna talk more about our project. Uh, again, my name is Deborah Sanders. I'm on the faculty in the economics and business department. And uh, thank you all for coming. So I have a relatively small part, but a critical part of the presentation because it was my class that was used as the subject of this experiment. So I have, um, the library's been very supportive of my class for years, in fact. I've been working with Madeline over the past, say, four years. Um, and she's been coming into the class to um, provide uh, instruction about how to use the library for, and particularly for my business management class, um, and which, we, which, is a re which we involves a research project. Uh, and a lot of library time, so Madeline's been coming to the classroom to teach students how to use the library. So uh, we were kind of a natural selection for this particular experiment where um, she wanted to continue her support for the class and also engage in research around this topic of the flipped classroom. So just to give you a little background about the particular project that we worked on together. As I mentioned, it's my business management class, which is a fundamentals of management course that all the business students are required to take here at Lehman. And in this particular class, students are required to conduct research on a specific or targeted company. And this research project lasts throughout the entire semester. So some of the learning objectives of the project is to gain proficiency in using the library database to collaborate uh, and gain and collect articles on the company that the students choose. They work in groups of, of five, four or five students at a time, and so they have to use the library to gain some background information uh, on the company. In the past, uh, Madeline has come in and given instruction in class on how to use the library, but in this case, we're using the flipped classroom concept where students are gonna get instruction through uh, a video ahead of time before coming to class to get a lecture on, on the topics. Um, so in the process, this is a semester long project, students become, uh, learn about the target's company uh, management, the industry that the company is working within, they have to get information about the company's revenue, historical revenue over the past five to seven years, they also have to learn about uh, the company's market share, where it stands relative to its competitors, um, the challenges that the managers make, all of this they have to gain this information through the research they do at the library. Um, they also get information about the competitor's revenue 
and um, the competitors' management's decisions and how they got to where they stand in the industry relative to the target company. Uh, a third piece of it is that they, the students are required to characterize the company in terms of its business environment, talking about all of the factors, the complex dynamics in the environment of the company, and to identify any ethical dilemmas that the company might be facing, and then understanding how managers address those ethical dilemmas, um, and whether or not they agree with the way that the managers address those the problems that they're facing. So all of this information is gained through library research. So uh, we, uh, one of the reasons that my particular class was ideal for this experiment is that I had two sections of the same business management course which allowed us to, to create a control group and an experimental group. One class received the flipped classroom version of the lecture or of the material and then the other class did not and got the instruction the way they had been getting it over the past few years. So the experimental class, we considered the, the flipped classroom, and then we had a control group which got the regular lecture. So uh, the librarians came to class and they gave all of the students a pretest to assess their knowledge of the subject matter, that subject matter being how to use the library to research this targeted company. Then the flipped class, which was a daytime class, uh, got links to videos and worksheets so that they could complete at home before coming to class lecture to help prepare them to do this assignment. After they received the links for the videos which show them how to use the library, how to access specific information re relative to their targeted business as well as the industry that the business operated in, they came back to class and they then got a test on their effectiveness in uh, using the library. All right, so here's some of the outcome and I think that it's pretty striking actually. Um, students that were in the flipped classroom showed better performance in finding and submitting journal articles, they had an average, this was the average grade that they received for this part of the assignment. So under the flipped classroom, that experimental group got a 95 average versus a 65. So that's a pretty striking difference. And then um, a second part of the assignment was to research, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the factors in the company's environment and any ethical challenges that the particular company was facing. And again, you can see that students in the flipped classroom got an average of 79 versus 66 for students who didn't get the assignments, the flipped classroom assignments ahead of time. One of the things that we um, didn't expect, but we talked to students afterwards to just get their feedback on this experiment and their experience using the material that was distributed by the librarians, uh, was that they reported using the library resources more often for even in their other classes. Lo and behold, they learned how to use the library. <laughs> and they found out that it was very beneficial, not just for this class, but for all their classes. So that was a really very good and positive outcome. And the students that were part of the experimental group also showed more enthusiasm about the assignment overall. So this is, as I mentioned, this is a semester long assignment. Students work in groups. There are uh, submissions throughout the semester, about four or five submissions. So it can get to a point where students are really a little tired of doing the project, but the enthusiasm remained high for the class that uh, got the flipped classroom. Um, they were a part of the experiment. This is another thing that surprised us until after we thought about how uh, social media and the use of YouTube has become such an integral part of young people's lives. Students reported watching the video, which gave instructions on how to access the material they needed for their targeted company over and over again. 
And we know, for those of us who have young people in our, in our household or in our lives, they do like to watch videos over and over again. So it turns out it's a wonderful way to teach students and to keep them engaged and to have some level of assurance that they're actually going to look at the material that you send them home with. So that was another positive um, and, and striking impact of the experiment. Okay, so now I want to turn it back over to um, Jennifer to talk about why. I think you got an idea already of why to use it for the classroom. Okay, Madeline is going to take over. Um, I'm, I'm going to do this part. Um, I think Deborah uh, already uh, alluded to many of the reasons why the flipped classroom for this particular class. Um, but in general, um, the flipped classroom is really student-centered learning as opposed to um, lecturer-centered learning. And um, as such, it engages the student much more and it's much more um, learn by doing, and therefore we hope uh, the retention would be higher and um, the actual um, um, investment on the part of the student is greater. Um, and some of these other um, uh, principles here are um, the ones that led us to try the flipped classroom that um, the pre-class work prepares students. One thing um, I uh, have uh, found and the other librarians who go into subject discipline classes to teach library research or what we sometimes call information literacy, uh, we do this on um, many levels, uh, undergraduate, graduate, uh, many different subject areas. There is often a large amount of material to cover in just one class session, which could be as short as an hour and 15 minutes. And um, in this particular case, the business management class, um, there are two sessions a week uh, for an hour and 15 minutes. And typically, I was coming in for just one of those sessions and uh, hoping to teach the students how to do research on companies involving about five different databases and um, many complex uh, concepts. So the short amount of class time to cover this material, and this is true for many other subject of disciplines, um, is one reason why giving a homework assignment for a, for a fundamental concept that you want students to learn ahead of time is, is really valuable. And um, I was also seeing that um, in the past, in previous semesters, I would go into this business management class, do the lecture and demo. The students would be interested. They sometimes would ask questions. But then um, a week later, I'd get a lot of questions from the students coming into the library, which was good. Um, we wanted them to do that, but the questions revealed to me that um, we were really starting from scratch all over again. Um, and that kind of uh, got me thinking that why weren't they able to uh, retain some of this information, such as, you know, where to start looking for um, a journal article in a business journal as opposed to where to start looking for an article in a newspaper. So um, I, I thought um, somehow I've, I've got to get them a little further along um, and the, the idea of doing active learning um, is the way we chose to go. Okay, so I want to step back a little and talk about some of the basics of the flipped classroom, which would apply to any subject discipline. And really, the components are learning objectives, which most of you are familiar with um, for your own teaching, um, the homework assignment, the in-class activities, and 
assessment. So um, planning is key, um, and this does take quite a bit of time. So um, if you're teaching an entire course, um, you may not want to do the flipped classroom for every single session. You could do it for some sessions. But those sessions do need to be planned carefully because the activities and the homework need to be linked to very distinct learning objectives. Um, so um, in particular, um, you want to select which learning objectives are um, amenable to a homework assignment and which should be uh, the learning objectives for the class itself, for the in-class activities. And a good way of doing that would be to rank the learning objectives. And um, those could be particular concepts you want the students to come away with for a unit of, of learning. For company research, it would be um, learning basics like is a company public or private, learning how to find articles about the company and so forth. So um, a list of, of, the, of the content that you want the students to learn um, for a particular class and then pick uh, the least complex or the most um, suited to independent learning uh, for the homework assignment. In other words, you have to think about whether students will realistically um, first do the assignment and second absorb um, a concept or learn a skill. So you don't want to give them something that's really too complicated or does need intervention from another person. Um, Okay, and then the more complex um, subjects, activities, or, or concepts uh, should be for the in-class learning. Um, okay, um, so it's a good idea to pick a, a fundamental concept or a building block concept for the homework. I mean, you'd like the students to come in knowing something and then building upon it. So if it's, um, um, you know, a history class, <coughs> you may assign a reading and then ask some questions on a worksheet that deal with, you know, the basic facts, what happened. Um, what happened um, and um, how does this fit in maybe with the whole um, general area that we're looking at. Or in a physics class, maybe it's just one particular um, you know, principle. What is an atom? Um, of course, you could spend the whole course on that, but you know, something very concrete should be designed as a homework assignment that could be completed in a short amount of time and which has some um, result to it, such as answers to questions. It could be an online quiz. It could be just a worksheet that they fill in. It could be a writing sample um, or reflection, you know, for a literature class, but something pretty discreet and um, something that lends itself to independent learning and give an incentive. Um, either make the homework part of the student's grade or extra credit or at the very minimum that they're required to turn in something to show that they did it. Otherwise, they will be, um, it, it will reflect in their participation part of the class, uh, that part of their grade. Okay, so I alluded to this before. The homework um, can be either high or low tech. Um, we chose video and Deborah gave good reasons for that. Um, doesn't have to be um, electronic in nature, but um, video tutorials are um, very um, popular and, and useful. Um, you can use interactive forms like Google Forms. 
other software that's out there, um, Blackboard, of course, um, um, and um, there are other video annotation services that one could use to interject some um, comments within a video, um, things like that. So thinking about the activity and what's the best medium and how are you going to deliver it? And will the students have the equipment? Are their computers well equipped, uh, fast enough, robust enough to work with various software? You don't want to give them something that's really out of the range uh, of their familiarity. And then um, the in-class activities as well um, can be done in various ways. You can have small group work. In this uh, class, the business class, we did ask the students to sit in groups because their project was a group project. Um, or um, if it's a different type of class, you could have little discussions and then have someone report back. You can do brainstorming, role playing. Games are getting very popular now in education. So. There are many ways. It just really <coughs> needs to be suitable for your learning outcomes and for your um, students and how much time these things will take. Uh, obviously, we're all constrained by time limits. So um, I just would mention it can be done very simply. Um, and you'll see later an example of a worksheet that I gave out. Um, and it was a paper worksheet. It didn't involve entering the information on the computer. So it was pretty low tech. OK, so those are the general ideas. There's much written about the flipped classroom. So later on, we'll point out a research guide that we prepared. And there are articles and um, resources, web resources, that all of you could consult. Um, so to give this a little more concrete reality, I'll go through quickly what we did in this business management class um, and show you the homework assignment, the, an example of an activity, and uh, talk about the assessment. So. Um, here are two learning objectives for the homework. Um, the objectives were students will be able to determine if a company is public or private. So that's very basic. Every student needs to know that by the time they come into class. The next thing would be students will be able to find data on a company, meaning it, this would be any company really, but they will work with the company they were assigned. But they can look up a company and find out the names of the executives, what industry, some financial data, what do they make, who are the competitors, so forth and so on. So that's, those are two things students need to do before they come into this class. And the assignment itself was a video tutorial showing them how to use one particular database, LexisNexis Academic. And through searching this database, they could accomplish those two learning objectives. So um, I gave them the assignment the week before we were going to do the flipped classroom, so they would have enough time. Uh, Jennifer and I came to Deborah's class, gave out the assignment in a print form, so nobody had an excuse that they didn't get to the website, they couldn't print it out, et cetera, et cetera, not to minimize those difficulties. But um, we wanted to make it really easy. And then we gave them a printed worksheet uh, with questions that they would turn in when they came to class. They would turn in the answers. And they would also get to keep that. So it, was useful to them. That, that's another incentive. Um, you know, you don't want to give students busy work. You don't want to give them an assignment that's 
really a waste of their time or too basic. Okay. Now the activities um, were to achieve a few different learning objectives, three, and e each activity was set up to achieve one of those learning objectives and there were worksheets attached. Now I want to make one other comment here about the flip class itself. Um, there is a little distortion sometimes in thinking about the flipped classroom that we're just turning over all the learning to the students, that teacher doesn't really have to do much. You know, we give them a homework assignment, give them these activities, they'll learn everything on their own. Well, that's far from the case because in the flipped classroom, in the room, during that hour and 15 minutes, both Deborah and I were walking around, answering students' questions. I introduced each activity with some commentary, some uh, rationale. Why are we doing this? What are you going to learn? Why is this important? Why do you need to know this? Okay, and then the class is quite spontaneous because students will start to do an activity and then have questions and I will realize, you know, I don't think they're grasping the entire um, set of, of, of uh, data that's in here. And so I better step back and really point this out to them. So, you know, I stop the class, say, heads up, everybody pay attention. Everybody needs to know this particular thing. So it's a combination of teaching with intervention. And it's good because it adapts to the students' own learning styles. It goes at a pace that's geared to what are they absorbing. And um, it enables us to um, learn from the students, actually, um, you know, what, what will mean the most to them in terms of um, an explanation or, you know, a hands-on activity. So this is an example of one uh, worksheet. It's a little small, so it's hard to read. Um, but this would be um, searching for a company in a certain database and writing down um, particular information based on that database. Um, and the learning objectives were teaching how to find journal articles, how to find financial data, and then how to locate a 10K report. Now, all of these are fundamental to the project that Deborah described because what Deborah's project involves is much more analysis, much more critical thinking about the data. But first, you have to find the data and know which data is accurate. So that's th these are the fundamentals. And the students do this by um, actually going into a database, doing the search, and filling out. This is yet another worksheet. This is very small. These slides will be posted uh, on a research guide, so you'll be able to go back to this. But this is just another example dealing with company revenue and asking the students to go, to go into a database, find the company revenue, and enter it, and then look for competitors and look for the industry. So they, they're doing this. And some of these items are not obvious when you look at the database. You have to, um, by trial and error, try to uh, see the best way to search. And you can learn it on your own, but um, the first time you do it, you'll probably have some questions, which the students did. So that's why we were there. Okay, so both sections, the flipped and the lecture, did get a pre and a post test. <coughs> we are still analyzing that data. And Jennifer and I and some other librarians are involved in a long-term research project. So we will analyze that data and attempt to make sense out of which method yields the best results, flipped or not flipped. Um, but we do have some qualitative data that we can share, some of it, um, some um, outcomes you already heard from Deborah, from 
her perspective of how she uh, viewed the students based on their work um, and what grades they received. But we put three questions at the end of um, the post-test, and um, these were qualitative ones. Did you enjoy today's class? If you completed the pre-class assignment, so that would be just for the flipped, how helpful was it? And then any comments? Um, we also decided um, that um, the, each class, both the lecture and the flip, would get a follow-up class. Um, Deborah decided this ahead of time, actually, because um, based on her experience, she felt that the students would need more than just one class. So we already had a follow-up coaching sec session built in. Um, and the students um, expressed their desire for that. Um, um, the videos were viewed a lot of, a, a large number of times. Um, I mean, there were only um, 30 students involved in the flip class doing the homework assignment. So during that semester, um, I looked up on um, uh, YouTube how many times that video was, was viewed, and it was 53 times, which given that the link was only given to people in this class, um, that's, that's quite a number of times. And then both classes had access to other videos, which um, they in fact did use. So that was, that was reassuring. But the attitudes, um, to get back to that extra, those extra questions that we put on the um, post-test, in the flip class, we had 19 students who agreed to participate in our research. Uh, that's because of IRB requirements. So those 19 students, um, 17 said they liked the class or they liked it a lot, two check neutral. None, there were none that said they didn't like the class. I mean, that was a choice. Um, and then if the homework, if the homework was helpful, 14, 14 out of 19 said it was very helpful, four helpful and one neutral. None said it was a waste of time, um, which I think was a choice. Um, and the control group that wasn't the flip class they also said they liked the library session, which does um, jive with my prior experience that while I was in the class doing a lecture, the students were engaged. It's a question of whether they retained that information. <clears throat> and some of these comments, which I'm not sure you can read, so I'll read one or two. Um, this was of the flipped class. Uh, this was a great library session. I found this very helpful full and supportive towards the project. I feel more confident in my ability to find research for the project. So, you know, given that they didn't have to write any comments at all, I think this is um, a good sign that um, this, this method was, was working. Okay, so now I'm going to turn this back to Deborah for a few more comments from the discipline faculty side. Okay, thanks, Madeline. I just have uh, a few more comments <coughs> about lessons learned. I think that um, active learning is the operative word in the flip classroom concept. And so it lends itself to teaching complex concepts. And I would suggest breaking down the complexity into steps and then using the flipped classroom for the foundation steps, the steps that students absolutely have to master to move on to the next stage. So I would certainly you know, use it for research projects where there are many different components that need to be pulled together in a final report. 
Um, I would use it again. I mean, this is we just did this one semester, but I certainly would use it again. There's one part of this business research project called the BCG matrix, where um, uh, which is a standard model that companies use to come up with strategies to, uh, you know, defeat the competitor or to advance their goals. And students had to put together this BCG matrix in this class. It's a complex matrix. And after, you know, students who were involved in the FIP classroom ended up going back to the library to get assistance with the BCG matrix, even though we hadn't talked about it. So. I would use it for, uh, for teaching a model, a model like that. Um, students love video. They like learning by video. So uh, the flip classroom lends itself to, to given an assignment that involves looking at a video. I mean, they express something that probably wouldn't surprise you. They could rewind if they miss something and listen to it over again, particularly if it's something that's describing steps in completing a task, and they like being able to do that. And it goes hand in hand with young people's learning habits today. So that's all I have to say, and I think Jennifer is gonna finish up the presentation. So we've already alluded to the fact that uh, we are going to try the flipped classroom experiment again next semester. We're going to have two more classes, we think. It's very likely. So we will be able to do the control and the experimental group again. Um, one thing that we want to try and which we would urge you to think about if you are considering doing a flipped experiment or a flipped class um, is to try to incorporate more assessment uh, in the moment, let's say. So um, this is one of the benefits of using technology to deliver that homework assignment, is that you can build in some formative assessment. You can, um, say, have a quiz for students where if they watch the video, they then do the quiz, and the quiz gives them instant feedback on how they've done. Uh, so something like um, Guide on the Side, which is a technology developed by this library in Arizona, um, is something that can enable that. Um, clickers and Poll Everywhere, which is an online kind of clicker system, um, can also do that. And I think that's really valuable for the students. It helps them learn better and helps them kind of correct their misconceptions. But it's also something that would be really useful uh, to us because we will then know when the students come in or even before they come in how many of them completed the homework assignment and how they did on it. Uh, so we will have a good sense of whether the class uh, has some common confusions. Uh, if there are mistakes that are being made repeatedly, we can correct those mistakes right off the bat at the beginning of class. And if none of them have done the homework assignment, uh, we can prompt them, say the night before, remind them that they need to do that homework assignment, please. Um, and if they still haven't done it, you know, an hour before class starts, then we can uh, hustle and try to come up with some way to make that active learning work when we already know that the students are not coming in with the homework assignment completed. The optimal situation is for them to have done it, of course. <laughs> so um, that's our presentation. Um, here's our contact information. We also, as Madeline alluded to um, our research guide, we have created a website, which hopefully will open up here, about the flipped classroom. It has um, some general information about it, some links to more resources, um, some tips on assessment, and um, I think examples of the homework assignment. So that is what we have for you today. Uh, I think I want to open it up for questions now. Yes? <laughs> The control, of, the control was the evening class, and I don't have any reason to believe that it would not work as well. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to get back to the podium. So yeah, the question about whether the control was an evening class and, and do I think it would work for an evening class. I mean, I don't have any reason to believe that it wouldn't. It was an evening class. Um, so, I mean, yes, usually the evening classes, the students are, are older, and I don't know if that would make a difference, but certainly we could try that. <laughs> we could try that with this, 
uh, next semester and see if there's any difference. Any other questions? Yeah. I did, in terms of, yeah, I did actually have the averages. Um, so earlier I gave the averages for some of the intermittent um, submissions. So in the end, uh, the results were the same. So the flip classroom, the overall average for the class final project, right? That's all of the group's average, if, this, if that's what you're asking me. Yeah, was an 87 and compared to the control group, which is a 79. So it was a still pretty substantial difference. I mean, it was our first time using this. There may be some factors that, you know, are, are at play that we're not aware of that we might find out during the experiment an, another time. But so far, I mean, I will say that there was one assignment that the control group actually scored higher in, and we've been talking about that, and I'm just not sure why that is, but all, but all the, the others and then the, the final project, the, the flipped classroom did score higher. I have a question as well. Yeah. Well, I would say it raised my awareness about uh, the extent to which students are um, internalizing and getting the concepts. And, you know, clearly, I think I've already said this, that there's these other um, facilities to reach students that I just really didn't realize would be as effective. Um, I, uh, I mean, I think that uh, if anything, additional follow-up, which was added to the flip classroom, even though we've been doing this research project in the past, we hadn't done the level of follow-up that we did with this experiment, and I think that's, that's important. So I just handed out a worksheet to those of you who are in the room. Um, it has a few questions you can ask yourself about um, doing the flipped classroom in your institution. Uh, a few tips uh, in the right-hand column, and then at the bottom of that column, the link to our research guide, which I showed you in the end. And those people who are watching online, that link is still up on the slides there as well. So if we have no more questions. I'll just make one more comment. In this particular case, um, I came into to Deborah's class um, by invitation, but she was very open to trying the flipped classroom. So um, obviously, if if um, the if it, the flipped classroom involves um, buy-in from the faculty who are teaching. Um, and in most cases, they'd be trying it out themselves. But in this case, it was due to uh, you know Deborah's um, uh, foresight and and willingness to experiment that you know we got to do this. Um, and I think that all faculty are most likely struggling with um, fitting in all the content that needs to be taught and struggling with learning objectives that include information literacy and critical thinking and um, being a citizen of the world and uh, quantitative uh, literacy, which we heard about this morning. So um, there's an awful lot for a faculty member to teach and any um, techniques that enhance the process, I think, are worth trying, even though they do require some thought and effort. 
and there are some challenges, but um, that's, that's true of everything. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thanks so much.